We are live, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all for sticking with us. We had crazy technical difficulties. As I'm sure if you've been to any other technical conference before, there's always uh, technical difficulties, especially when we're when technologists are involved. So um, thank you for sticking around. We are here. We are ready to go. I'm super excited. I've been waiting for this workshop for the entire time because NFTs are super cool. I'm really into them. And it's like a, a, a super hot um, it's a buzz. There's a big buzz going on around it. There's lots of applications for it. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, Joey's game today. Um, and uh, we also have Jerry and JT on the line uh, who are going to jump in at different points um, during the presentation. So um, normally we like to do a bit of a uh, interview, a little bit of a conversation going in. But you guys have stuck in and waited uh, for this as well so, for so long. I think we're going to jump right into it. I do want to draw folks' attention, though, to the Ask a, a Question button. If during the presentation you have any questions, feel free to drop it in there. If there's a question you really want to know the answer to, give it an upvote and we'll make sure we get through all of them. Um, and just beside that, we have a polls option. I'm going to take a quick peek in there. What do we have? Um, so I wanted to know what you guys were excited most about in the NFT space. Is it gaming? Is it unique financial instruments? Is it authentication tokens? Is it proof of attendance um, or a badge? Is it crypto art or something else? What are you most excited about? If it's something else not on this list, please let us know in the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear you, uh, hear your voice. But it looks like most of you guys so far are interested in the gaming aspect of things. That is super cool. We're going to talk about a NFT-based game today. Um, I also wanted to know if you've built NFTs before. And uh, most of you are saying they haven't found the right use case. But 25% uh, say they have. So that's super cool. Um, if it's something public and, and uh, you want to share that with us, drop that in the chat. Let us know where we can uh, find your NFTs, what the use case was. Uh, and I also wanted to know what NFT platforms you've used. Uh, was it CryptoKitties? Was it Gods Unchained? Was it Decentraland? Um, and it looks like a lot of folks have, have dabbled in the CryptoKitties. And then 33% uh, of folks said at least two of, of the uh, three above mentioned. So super cool. Um, let us know any other platforms that you currently use NFTs on. But I think that is enough delay for me. We're going to jump into the meat of things with Joey, JT, and Jerry. So I'd like everyone to help me welcome uh, to the stage. We have Joey. He is uh, director of the SLP Foundation, co-founder of Spice Token, and the creator of Spice Feed, which is a, uh, a social media platform built with SLP. Um, currently, he's working on an SLP game, which we're about to find out about, and he's going to share some exciting news about it. Um, and he's also one of the uh, mentors that we have. If you're working on BCH or SLP specifically, um, he's one of the mentors you can find in our Discord. We also have Jerry Chen. Um, he's involved. Uh, he's been involved. He's an OG in the uh, Bitcoin and blockchain space uh, since 2013. He's an advisor of techno uh, technology companies looking to integrate blockchain technology, and he's also a founding member of uh, Bitcoin Bay, uh, the team leading Block Hack. Uh, this. Um, the, the hackathon you guys are all a part of. Um, and we also have JT, who is the lead dev at SLP. He's co-founder of Fountainhead.cash, uh, which is a suite of developer services and the inventor of many of the SLP tools, some of which we've um, we talked about in one of the previous talks. So I highly suggest go checking out um, those talks. And you can also give us a follow. Um, following this channel will give you notifications when we go live with these amazing workshops. We are, though, coming towards an end of our, our workshop series that we've had going on. So there's a whole um, catalog of talks and workshops that you can find on our channel. Um, you can check those out just after, after this. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Joey as he takes over the cast. Welcome, Joey. Hello. Uh, I need to press share screen, or does this automatically? Yeah, no, you, you, uh, you just yeah share your screen and take it away. OK. Is my screen being shared? Yeah, it's, it's coming up now. <laughs> yeah, OK. Looks good. Um, 
Let me go full screen on that. Is that like, huh? The press present? I don't yep. remember this. Okay. Oh, I remember this. So I need to, I need to like, huh? Oh, just saw some. I need to like exit this. So drag this out. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to do some. Desktop making, where did that go? Oh, okay. So, right. Okay. But yeah, I just wanted to sort of uh, go into like, uh, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure like people are pretty familiar with like uh, non-fungible tokens, but I wanted to sort of run through like uh, some example projects that have been going around on the ecosphere. I think the most famous one is Poor Crypto Kitties. Like that's the one that in 2017, like, you know, that totally exploded and then that like almost crashed the Ethereum uh, blockchain. But um, yeah, so like there are a lot of uh, different use cases for non fungible for non fungible tokens. And basically the the, the premise for non-fungible tokens is kind of a really fancy name for basically a token that cannot split apart, right? So basically, there is just this token that you can't split apart. You can't, like, uh, make decimal points out of it. Um, and uh, I want to go through some use cases. So games, obviously, a big one. Uh, like, I, I put some examples here, Gods Unchained. Uh, e for Legends, uh, so rare, Rarible, uh, CryptoKitties, um, Axie Infinite. Um, Engine Core is a big uh, gaming platform that uh, seems pretty successful, though I think um, with the fee problem at the moment, but they're going to be looking at scaling layer two. Um, asset ownership, that's a, that's a big one. So basically a decentralized, like really huge, that's like a land kind of thing, like a, like a virtual land. There's crypto voxels, uh, security tokens, uh, real assets. Uh, Ava stars. Um, so that's like with with digital with digital identity. Uh, that's the one where it's like how do I, how do I explain? That? I think it's far better for me to show you some of this stuff. Uh, so this is one that I I I I really like. So what they've done here in Ava stars is with the NFT tokens. We'll go into this later. Uh, that you can put metadata in the NFT tokens, and basically one of the earliest sort of issues people had of the ERC uh, is it 762 uh, token is that basically you couldn't really, they sort of struggled with it a little bit. They didn't really struggle, but people were kind of going, well, it's, you know, this, this thing is like meant to be true ownership. It's meant to be transferable. It's meant to be like authentic, but you know, at the end of the day, it's still all hosted on like a main server, right? Like, uh, like how do you, how do you put this uh, like data on? So people started playing around with metadata and um, like actually like trying to put the data onto the blockchain, right? Otherwise, if at the end of the day, if it's just a token and it just points to some website, right? If that uh, website comes down, then that token kind of becomes, well, what are you saying you're owning really? You're not owning the art. So, you know, obviously with the blockchain, it's very inefficient to put uh, large image files onto the blockchain. Um, so these guys at Ava Stars actually figured a way out of doing the same kind of things with CryptoKitties, which, by the way, CryptoKitties doesn't actually store the CryptoKitty um, on the NFT token. What they do is they have a sort of metadata that they uh, run through their own server to parse to render the CryptoKitty uh, out. So actually, if you owned the actual CryptoKitty token, you just own sort of the genetic hash of the CryptoKitties and not really the artwork or what, what the CryptoKitty looks like. So if the CryptoKitty server, go, as, I, as I understand it anyways, uh, they might have developed it since then. But as I understand that if CryptoKitties uh, went down, then basically uh, that metadata, well, basically you wouldn't have the image, right? So what these people have figured out is what they do with this genetic stuff is they have managed to write something that just basically, uses SVG, it's all vector graphics. They've managed to done it on like vector graphics and the, you can always just render the vector graphics out of the blockchain into like uh, these uh, Ava stars. So I thought that was a pretty cool project 
like as like a sort of art thing. So none of this is like on like uh, pixel data. This is all like SVG and it's all like using the same kind of genetic algorithms that CryptoKitties are using. And we'll kind of go lightly into that like uh, later. Um, there's Axie in Infinity. So I keep calling it Axie Infinite. But Axie Infinity, this is like a pretty popular one right now on um, Ethereum that you they uh, you kind of collect pets and like battle with them. Um, Gods and Chain is like this one that successfully raised a lot of money. I'm, I'm, I'm about to go into that about how big an industry this actually is. Um, though I forgot the exact amount they raised, but they raised a huge amount of money. I think it's like 10 or 20 million venture capital. Um, as far as I'm aware, there actually isn't that many transactions on uh, Gods and Chain. Uh, but as you can see, this is very, very high budget, like lots and lots of money has gone into this. And uh, this is just an example of that. A lot of people think that this stuff has huge potential. Um, a great website I like, and a lot of Ethereum folks will notice, it's nonfungible.com. And um, this is a great site to basically look at basically all the stats. So here you can see, uh, like, and, and this is really impressive because I looked at this like, when I first started building the game, you know, Enter the Sphere, like in February, I actually looked at this and the volume was a lot lower, right? Like for sure, like I was not trading like 4 million in like 24 hours, oh, sorry, seven days. Uh, sorry, yeah. How much is that? Yeah, so 4 million, oh, is it 4 million? Yeah, 4 million in seven days. And this, these figures have definitely gone up, right? So I just think like this stuff, um, it's going to expo explode. And what I find really interesting is that uh, Decentralized actually, uh, Decentral Land is actually up there, which is, a, which is an app that uh, allows you to just buy basically voxel space and you can just like sort of crypto uh, real estate. And you can just, it's just like Minecraft or something, but you actually just own the land or Second Life. And that's a really cool project. Um, so that's a kind of asset ownership. Um, and Rarible, this is E for Legends like cards. Rarible is like sports cards and you can put all sorts of stuff into there. Um, so went through with some, of, some of this, decentralized security token. So you could use NFT to link that to uh, like, cause security tokens are, as a, uh, securities are not splittable, right? Um, and, you know, that could be like a thing where people could use it to link it to like a legal almost any sort of legal um, contract that basically ensures you have a share to a, a real company, right? Uh, real physical assets, I think people have been working on that, like actually owning like property and that kind of stuff. Uh, digital identity, so this is like super interesting, like basically what you can use NFT as, uh, we're gonna go into that in a bit on, NS, uh, on SLP chat, uh, basically, you can actually use the tokens not just as a way of owning something, but you can use it to basically um, use it as a sign in. So you can use it to like sign uh, access control. You can use it to sign into your car or use it to sign into your house. And uh, you can use it as almost like like zero off, zero off, right? Like Facebook. Um, and yeah, like, you know, you log into like any Facebook, you use your like digital identity identity, right? Token off is something that uh, James Kramer is working on. And basically it's like a, a easy to use API on SLP that allows you to um, basically create these uh, token of authentication systems very easily, uh, which we look forward to using on, on the sphere. Um, there's Emblem Wallet. Emblem Wallet is like, there's this new idea now that you can put like a, a like a bunch of items, a bunch of like different cryptocurrencies currencies and wrap them around in an NFT. So that's um, that's pretty exciting because um, that's pretty cool if you can do that. And then there's also semi non fungible, like so, you know, vouchers and tickets. And there's a bunch of like assets that sort of like, it's like, it's a spectrum from like fungible to non fungible. And there's all these sort of things that um, lie in between. Um, and there's more, I mean, there's actually like loads of marketplaces. So uh, OpenSeas is a big one. Uh, OpenSeas is another Ethereum one and um, you can trade. And this is the great, this is the really cool thing about um, NFT items is that once you take them out of the application, you can put them on on these like public marketplaces 
And basically people like trade art, like this is like, you can see digital art, people trade um, game items, virtual world items, collectibles. I mean, just, I mean, this space is just booming. I think this space is just gonna get absolutely huge. Um, so those are some examples. I don't want to spend too much time on this because uh, NFT is like absolutely huge. And every week there's some new project that comes out and, uh, you know, I've, you know, it's like a new idea. So you're welcome to just look, um, on about, you know, what stuff. So we just want to quickly cover some quick stuff. Like how big is this space? Right. So, you know, it's going to grow. I mean, you look at the, these numbers in 2017, it's like 30 million. And then you're looking at projected forecast there of 300 million by um, 2020, right? And the market cap in 2019 is 210 million. Uh, so yeah, you look at that, that's um, exponential, I think. Yeah, I guess so. It's like growing really quickly. Um, and uh, here are some cool things. So like uh, some of the biggest trades ever, like uh, Gods and Chain card uh, traded for 31,000. Dollars, a gods and chain card traded for thirty-five thousand uh, dollars. It's a spaceship that got sold for forty-five thousand dollars. Jesus Christ! Okay. Um, there's the central land, the secrets of Satoshi's Tea Garden. It's like a penthouse, apparently, and um, yeah, it was uh, sold for eighty thousand. So, so those are. It's just quick market analysis, you know, uh, you know, this is a, talking about the games market, total games market is $159 billion and that's going to grow, right? Like with the COVID happening, like the entire world is sort of, people are getting, like things are getting more virtualized and the virus has speeded up things towards digitization, right? So not only is that video games are growing and the games item economy has been growing even without blockchain, right? But with all this combined, this is probably like actually gonna, and there's actually like a link that I put that, you know, I can put that link somewhere that it's been like a, a blockchain gaming has been generating a record revenue uh, because of the virus. So I just wanted to remind, like gonna go into like SLP NFT, but I just wanna do some quick like reminders of a workshop I did earlier. So if you wanna um, learn more about SLP, it's better to watch the prior workshop that we had uh, called Intro and Overview to the SLP Ecosystem, where I sort of we cover a lot more about how SLP works and what's on the SLP Ecosystem. And basically, and basically like to, to sort of sum it up, like SLP is a token system built on top of Bitcoin Cash and it rides on top of the Bitcoin Cash. And why build on Bitcoin Cash? Bitcoin Cash is, Huge wallet adoption, Bitcoin.com has over 300K installs, wide merchant adoption, low fees, fast. It's a top cryptocurrency, fifth market cap currently, proof of work. So fair coin distribution, tons of miners, decentralized. There's no, there's no one, no central entity running Bitcoin Cash. Um, it's highly sc scalable. Uh, there's a CDS upgrade on it that differentiates it from Bitcoin Core that allows Oracle's smart contracts and other features. So, you know, just explaining why, you know, why, you know, SLP is strong because it's built on top of Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Cash is like sort of the security enforcing it with proof of work, right? So the fact that it has, you know, a high amount of adop adoption, high amount of liquidity and all this mining means that SLP is also backed and SLP NFTs are, is also backed by that uh, blockchain, right? Okay, so just again, quick like SLP selling points. It's lightweight, it's plug and play, low barrier of entry. So super fast, super cheap, can do smart contracts, mint stuff very easily, and you can just get started with JavaScript and zero conf allows rapid testing. So let's get to the meat of it. Like uh, what, 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 um, what, so people kind of, I guess people kind of ask like, well, you can do NFTs on like Ethereum, you can do NFTs on like, Stellar, you can do LS NFTs. I think almost every blockchain offers NFTs, right? So, you know, I think a valid question to ask is why do NFTs on SLP, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you can do SLP. So I already said that, well, you know, it's built on Bitcoin Cash, which is, uh, you know, top, top cryptocurrency, a very decentralized proof of work, but also doesn't have the problems of Bitcoin Core or Ethereum where you're stuck with these fees, right? So one of the big things that's happening on um, Ethereum, like for example, Engine Coin or uh, ETH Legends, 
um, they can't actually trade. I mean, they can't trade. I mean, when they trade these cards, you look at the cards like maybe here, like, uh, you know, one USD, two USD per, per card, you're getting charged like $5 fees, right? You're not going to really make any money like trading. So, and you, you know, there are other things like merging cards and doing other things of like NFT items and they just can't do anything. So the, those chains are kind of like, those ecosystems are kind of just waiting for layer two for scaling, right? And they'll probably solve those. So I would say that that's maybe not, you know, just a temporary advantage, but uh, I think it's a great advantage that on Bitcoin Cash immediately, that's not a problem. And it's all done on layer one. So we don't have to do sharding and do all this uh, abstraction. Um, advanced traits. So we'll, we'll dive into this in a little bit. Uh, like basically the group ID parent and child tokens allow us a way to identify like NFT tokens data hierarchy. And that means that if you have something, say from the sphere or from your app, we have a really good way of being able to, to, to figure out where is this token from? Like, is it a real, is it really from the, is it really from, you know, the app? Like people can't easily make duplicates of your art. If they made it, they can, people can actually see it's a fake uh, very easily on the blockchain. Um, and then you can do a lot more stuff with that as well. It's very easy to create and start. So you can literally, uh, you can use Electron Cash and just like mint it in a few clicks and exactly the same as what I showed in the other workshop, you know, and we'll show in a bit, you can just make the token with one click. So very easy to very quickly create this uh, data structure. Am I still on them? Yeah, you're Hello? still going. We, we have a question here though, that, uh, that's been getting some upvotes. Um, uh, folks want to know if, if they build a hugely popular game on Bitcoin Cash or using SLP, is it going to, um, you know, uh, is it going to grind down the, the system like it did for CryptoKitties? Is, are no, transaction no. fees going to be an issue? 100% not at all. I mean, I mean uh, Bitcoin Cash is designed to be extremely highly scalable. Um, well, I mean, it's like at the moment, it's like 32 times the size of... Uh, you know, Bitcoin core and it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do you want to, JD, do you have a better technical answer to that? I think it's like very unlikely, like anything yeah, would. Yeah, I mean. The, it's also adaptable, right? The block size is adaptable. So we can actually go higher than 32 MB if uh, we ever hit that. Yeah, you'd have to have a game that within, you know, a few months became multiple times more popular than Bitcoin and Ethereum and a, and a bunch of other cryptocurrencies combined. Um, so that that's really a unrealistic growth trajectory um, because the 32 megabytes isn't set. That's just, you know, more than enough space for, for people to react even in a breakout situation like that. I mean, it'd have to be so extreme. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a problem. Um, I just want to add, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, a lot of the, the validation done for the SLP tokens are not done by the blockchain miners or the nodes. Um, basically, it would be third party, um, um, basically a third party entity that would be sorting out through the, the transactions on the, on the blockchain and then validating it separately so that it basically alleviates a lot of the work that would have ended up um, increasing the costs. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to point out that because um, one thing that we do have that's really cool versus uh, Ethereum and um, uh, Bitcoin uh, Core is that with uh, zero conf technology uh, and you know double proof spending, which is coming, like the transactions are like that. So it's, you're literally talking like, yeah, they're super fast. Like it's going to be instantaneous, you know, NFT transfers. So that's not only it's not only cheap, it's not only fast, it's also like scalable. And I think someone did a thing where we could probably do like PayPal type stuff. Like if someone ever built a game that scaled to such a global like proportion, it, you know, we could probably like handle like quite a lot of, yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, it's, it's definitely not a problem. Like, I mean, on almost anything, on almost everything I understand about Bitcoin Cash is definitely not, scalability is not, a, I mean, the, the entire chain exists to deal with scalability on, uh, on layer one. So that's basically what Bitcoin Cash was built to solve. Hello. That that's awesome. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. 
Um, there is another question here that uh, we can take now or we can uh, save for the end. But uh, the question is uh, dealing with uh, Polkadot. And if you were planning on, uh, if B, uh, SLP or BCH is planning on building a bridge to Polkadot. Uh, we'd love to actually. We are. I mean, if there's any hackers here, we we have uh, we have an open channel on the uh, on the Discord, and uh, Jesse and Kramer and JT are on there, and uh, there's a bunch of people on there that have like proposed a few because because as, as I understand it, you know, Polkadot has just done a bridge of Bitcoin, right? And uh, so Bitcoin Core and. Bitcoin Cash uses exactly the same model as Bitcoin. So if you can do it with Bitcoin, then you can just do it with Bitcoin Cash, I'm pretty sure. So, and we have a, we have a, a, a thousand USD bounty. So if anyone wants to even do a proof of concept, then definitely that'll go to you immediately. <laughs> so uh, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely be up for that. I want to add, I want to add that basically, I, I, for me personally, I think the futures of NFTs is that it's going to trade across different chains like you would be able to i think i had i sort of talked about this in the slp intro right you'll be able to move like a game item from like ethereum to slp or from slp to ethereum and vice versa from counterparty to slp that's something that um spells of genesis is looking at so um yeah like definitely i feel like in the future like a lot of these will just sort of converge right so definitely yeah, one hundred percent. Yes, we would be interested in having a bridge. Awesome. Uh, I think that wraps up all our questions for now. So, if you wanted to jump back into where you were at, cool. Okay, so I just wanted to sort of give a high level, like uh, NFT, uh, sort of explanation. Uh, so, what happens with the with what? Well, there's a, a spec that has been laid out on slp.dev oh I, I was on was that on slp.dev oh yeah i was okay cool yeah so it's like called a, it's called the nft type one specification uh anyone who's interested in nft uh on slp i'll put that link into oh i can't how do i get to chat oh it's okay i'll put the link later <laughs> so um yeah, so going back into that, a very important, like to explain the architecture a little bit. Basically, NFT type one is a special kind of NFT, a special, special kind of SLP token that was developed specifically for NFT. So actually on the original type one SLP token, you could actually do NFTs already because what is an NFT? An NFT is just basically a token that you can't split, right? So when you mint the SLP token, you just kind of go like, like zero decimal points and then that would be like your NFT token, right? So NFT one actually takes that and takes it one step further. It adds another thing called the group ID uh, and the parent-child relationship. So when you create a um, NFT token, what you actually create is you create something called a parent ID or a, uh, a group ID, they call it group ID or parent. And basically from that, you can use that group ID, that ID, ID is the minting baton. And the minting baton can basically like mint different child NFTs. But that these um, childs would always be linked back to the group, right? So you end up having this like hierarchy that allows people to see, hey, you know, say if you're like, let, let's say we have NFT one group here and it's like, JT's art or something, right? Or Jerry's art. And then he would create like, you know, something he drew and then some painting or some pics of himself or something, right? And um, yeah, then you could always look at those NFTs on the Explorer and trace it back to, hey, you know, actually this, is, this belongs to JT's art, right? Um, and it's done in a way where it can be, this, this data model uh, can be exploited in many ways. Uh, to create all sorts of interesting apps. So I uh, want to run through this a little bit about how it's um, it's it's done. So all these are going to are minor checked. So when you generate like a, a parent NFT Genesis, it generates like a, a minting baton. And basically you can move that minting baton anywhere in the, you can, you can pass that minting baton to someone else. So for example, if, if say I was running an art app, 
and I created a group ID token of JT the offer, right? I can actually send him that and then he can use that to mint these childs, right? Oh, actually this arrow is wrong. This arrow should be pointing this way. So that's a mistake, sorry guys. Um, and every time the child, every time the mint token creates a child, basically what it does is it basically replicates itself um, and then it burns itself. I think it burns, it burns, sorry, it spends the unspent UTXO, the unspent transaction on the minting baton. And then it um, creates a child NFT. And that child NFT can then be transferred. And obviously because the metadata that goes in the parent token can be different to every child. So every child you create could have a new metadata. So for example, like if I created like, uh, I'll show you in a bit, but basically every child could like have say, you know, like different art or different uh, data in it. And that could always, always be linked back to the parent. Um, just wanted to see if I'm getting any of this wrong. Uh, JT, Jerry, you want to jump in? Um, I don't know if I explained that well. This is, this is yeah. one I want to know. Yeah, I think it's mostly right, but I think the easier way to think of it is, yeah, you're, you're just, uh, you know, burning a, a parent token or a group token. And in that burn, burn of that, you're doing a genesis um, and that creates this new NFT child. Um, and then, so yeah, uh, you know, that, that's sort of the, the magic to it. And that's what ties these together because you can see, you know, you're, you're converting it basically. It's not, not really a, you know, it's, I say burn, but you're basically converting that group token into a NFT one child token through a Genesis transaction. So um, that's why, that's why uh, it's really simple to validate this on chain because you can just look at the, uh, you know, the inputs to a transaction until you, you get to the point where that token was created. Cool. Anything to add, Jerry? Um, yeah, no, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, no, not really. Yeah, so so these arrows could actually be seen both ways. I, I had uh, trouble. Oh, it is my camera on? My camera, okay, my camera is on. Um, yeah, like, um, I had trouble like, uh, doing this because they actually sort of go both ways. Uh, the miner, when it, when it crawls through the DAG, it actually goes through the other way. As far as I understand, the DAG is actually, it goes the other way, but I just did it this way because it, it's poor, like how a user would think of it, that you make a, uh, you know, the, the parent and then you make the child. But, uh, you know, if, if the, if the miner was checking and it was going through the DAG, it would basically go the other way. So technically, it, the arrows can go both ways, as I understand it. Yep, so that's it. Um, so yeah, this is like an, I'm just gonna quickly run through this. This is uh, James Kramer's idea, but this is like an example of how you would uh, build a, uh, you know, we were talking about digital identity, right? So one of the ideas was like, well, how do you, you could actually use this to build like a totally decentralized uh, chat application, right? Just with this, uh, um, NFT, uh, SLP NFT tech, right? Um, so you'd be able to build a, via using IPFS and SLP, you'd be able to build a chat application that uses your NFT. So if you had, say, exa for example, if I had like Joey's Club, right? And I wanted to issue like membership passes and I'll be like, hey, if only if you have this NFT, you can come to my club and see my, I don't know, like, I don't know, game collection or something. <laughs> Um, yeah, and basically you'll be able to use those NFTs as sign-ins, right? But that would be like totally like your keys. So you would totally own the identity, right? You wouldn't be, no one would be able to like censor you or like stop you from logging in. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but basically the idea is that, yeah, you would have the NFT one group that's like the admin and then it would, every, every child token would basically be like a key. And you'd send these keys to like people that, well, you want to have access, right? And then I guess they could trade these keys if they want. Like maybe over time, if there's only like 90 people that can join the channel, people will actually be like, hey, do you want my slot? I can sell this, right? Um, so it's like the topology of it or, you know, structure. So it kind of go into a little bit of this, like in a bit about how the data would be sort of stored on like a DAP. Um, but you can sort of, I, I can send these slides if people want to see them.
Yeah, so here you see like when, so here, here's a really great example, right? Here's a really great example why uh, NFTs on SLP is so cool. So what you can do is by using that group ID and child token, a hierarchy we're talking about, we can actually link different metadata. So you can see that on the uh, on D NFT one uh, group token, the group token ID, which is the parent token, you can actually have the, the group chats Genesis URL and the group chats ID, right? So it's similar to how Telegram bots work. If you're like familiar with them, like Telegram has, uh, sorry, Telegram has group chat IDs and that'll be the ID, but then you could also like, you know, then with the child tokens, which I guess you would send to the users, basically that would, um, you know, that would basically be all the users, right? But you could always link that back to that was issued from the group token. So there wouldn't be anyone who could like hack that, right? Like if you have this, then basically, you know, you own that for sure. You own that access for sure, right? No one can actually, well, if you were to hack this, you would have to hack the blockchain, which is secured by Bitcoin Cash. So um, this is just like how it, how it works because some of it requires IPFS to basically uh, keep keep data. Um, so yeah, like I guess we can go like now into so how does how how do how how is metadata stored on SLP NFTs, right? So I already sort of covered some of it. Like uh, there's the group ID, the the token, so you can store metadata on that. Like each um, SLP token has like two different main fields. There's the URL or URI, and basically you can sort of store data on that. There's the hash, um, which is stored in op return. So basically you can store like a limited amount of data pointing to something. Um, and then there's the, when you mint a child token, you can put metadata into that as well, right? Um, and in both of these, there is both the document URL and the, the document URL data and the hash. And um, basically the hash originally on the SLP was designed to allow you to get the, to allow you to check that the document hasn't changed. So if someone put a white paper up and they change the white paper, you're supposed to use the hash to be able to verify the white paper is, hasn't been like tampered with in any case, but you can put anything in these fields. So basically, whatever hash you want to put into there, that, that could be useful for other things, right? Um, there's SLP DAP ID. So SLP DAP ID is a standard that we're working on at the SLP Foundation that is going to standardize a uh, data schema of um, how data is stored, right? So because of the limited amount of data that you can store in a document URL, it makes more sense to point the document URL to something that's stored on the blockchain as a JSON file. And based on that JSON file, the metadata would have an ID, right? So for example, if I'm building a game, that'll be like a DAP ID one, or if someone's building SLP chat, that'll be a DAP ID two. Um, and here's like an example of the SLP um, DAP, how, how that would work. So what would, how that would work, right? Is that on the child token, you know, the document URL data, instead of storing the data like Ava stars or storing the data like genetics, right? What you would do is you would point that to Bitcoin files, which you use to upload a uh, immutable data to the blockchain, right? Um, so that would all be a JSON schema that's basically tied to uh, the SLP DAP ID. And then the application would pull the schema from the JSON and parse it, right? Based on the SLP DAP ID. Now I wonder if I have the SLP DAP ID thing open. DAP ID, okay. All right. So this is like still in the works. I mean, this is not uh, released yet, but this is basically the repository for what this would look like in the future, right? Um, and it's like pretty much like done. It just needs like further review. And basically what people would do is that they would submit a spec of how they want the data. So for example, there's an example here. Uh, and for example, here on this FUBAR protocol spec, um, he's like outlined how, how the document URI would be used, how the hash would be used, um, like, you know, certain data schema rules that would be followed. And basically if that was like a JSON object, and that's by the way, the way I, I've sort of done this 
is that's just one way of doing it. So there's multiple ways you can store this data schema. I've heard of like use protobuf or like some other way of storing like the object, right? So at the end of the day, what it means is you put an object, like an array into, the, into Bitcoin files and then you point the your, your I data. I don't know why I put URL, I guess it's your I um, into Bitcoin files, right? And then through, you know, the SLP DAP ID, you basically use that your in your application to parse. Hey, you know, say example for example in my game, I want experience, I want levels, I want um, I want achievements, right? I can do that all basically using this uh, DAP. And then if you're like SLP, uh, you know, chat, you might want like user, you you might want username, you might want like uh, their access or like access rank or other things that you want on like a social media app, right? So that's like how that, you know, going back to this, like you put this all, if you if you put this all together, this is like a really powerful way to like, well, you think you can like store it almost anything, right? I mean, you can even, you can even take this JSON data and be like, hey, I want to point it to Filecoin, right? You can like, well, how you could do it, you could set the, you could set the schema up in a way that you can go, hey, you know, actually the schema is that always points to an IPFS or always points to a Filecoin link, right? Link, right? And then people would like be able to like download that JSON object and go, okay, I know where to get the artwork. You know, I can get that off another chain. I can get that off something that's decentralized, but can store a lot of data, right? Like Filecoin or IPFS. So the possibilities of what you can do is endless. This is like, just like the beginning, right? Um, and there's like a chart here that explains a file uploaded to the blockchain using an initial funding transaction followed by two data chunks, right? Data stored within the operator return space highlighted as yellow. So that's basically how it's stored. So I just want to go in an example of like how, you know, because you kind of go like, oh, okay, great. I mean, so far it sounds like you have a lot of stuff, but you know, like, I don't know, like how do you link it all together? So I've got an example. This is what I've been uh, developing in the background for my uh, game, Enter the Sphere. So we can actually chain all the data together using the group ID and uh, child. So we have a thing we're working on the sphere called the avatar system. And basically the way it would be, done, would be, would be like you have your own character, but all your NFT items could actually be linked back to your um, avatar, right? And that could all be done on chain. So you could, in theory, though it's not been like really worked on yet, like worked out fully yet, that you can take your avatar out of the game and you can use smart contracts to play against other people off chain without ever touching the central server, right? Um, and how we do this is by using the SLP, the advanced functionality, uh, the advanced functionality of, um, SLP NFTs, right? So you can see how you would do this, pretty simple. Um, you could actually link two um, parent tokens together, right? So you have the Sphere Group ID, which basically this is for how the Explorer and other ecosystem and Bitcoin cash would basically go, well, you know, how do I know you're not making up like some like thing that's not in the game and cheating, right? But they could always trace it back to that, hey, you know, this actually came from the Sphere's group ID. So only the person that owns the Sphere could actually possibly actually mint this item, right? But what's really cool is what we can do is we can have another group ID and using the, using the hash field here, I can actually link this group ID parent token to another group ID, creating a data hierarchy. And via that, I can do this with for, for I can do this with like other tokens. I can do this with other tokens that are childs of other. So this could be the child of like another game or like the sphere. And I can use the same mechanism by using the hash field, just declaring the token that it's like chaining to, to chain it all back to the character, right? Or I can use this to be like, they could all be child. And basically they would all automatically link back to this parent, right? And you want to go further than just like the items that your characters, your character, your avatar is equipped, right? What we can do is you can have like badges. So if you've like unlocked 
something like in the sphere, like you can get an achievement and attach that to your avatar, right? And all this could be like done on chain. So it can all be seen in the Explorer and you can take this, you could take this out of the game and an Explorer or a marketplace would read it and it would read all this data without ever having to touch, you know, the sphere's uh, server, right? Um, so you can see like, you sort of build this out or right? anyone tries to like figure something you know, you can actually do like all sorts of things that I, I have no idea, like what people can think of at the moment. Yeah. Do we have any questions so far about? Um... Uh, there was a question in the chat that I saw. I was uh, was wondering if they were, there was a couple questions I thought they might um, combine into one and put in the question box, but I'll see if I can parse through it. Um, they're asking about, is the NFT child supposed to just replace the original and then they go on to ask, is it just moving it or um, or you want to convert it to a child NFT or for a practical reason? Not sure. The only practical reason to create a child is to link it to a group ID. So let's say, for example, I want to link a certain group of game items all to one uh, group ID, right? So what I would do is I would go, okay, let's say I have, um, let's say I have a special class of special weapons, right? I could create a group ID called special weapons. I could link that to the sphere. And then every child from that would be linked to the special weapons like group ID, right? I don't know if that makes sense. So it, it's just how you want to build it. It's like building a, um, relational database, right? But you're just doing it on chain. So you can structure it any way you want. And I showed you a great example because SLP chat uses a completely different way of uh, abusing the same system. Uh, so exploiting the same system. Um, and uh, I guess the limits are just your imagination. Like what you what you want to do with the data structure. If you just want to create like loads of group, I if you just want to create one group ID and just create loads of child, you could also do that. There's no, there's no need to complicate things unless you're looking to do something more advanced. Cool. Cool. So I don't know what's next actually. Okay. So how easy is this? Let's, uh, so this is really cool. Like, uh, Jerry, who is like an expert in like Bitcoin cash, he's like created a little tool to like, uh, create like NFT items. I just want him to sort of demonstrate a little bit how the tool works. Uh, you can actually do this like on Electron Cash, but he created something that basically you can do it all on like a UI. And I thought it was like super cool. So uh, are you ready to demo it, Jerry, for a little bit, just quickly? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let me just um, <clears throat> just get the screen share up and going. All right. Um, so I think I should be screen sharing uh, my slide. Can everyone see this? Yep. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, so as Joey mentioned, um, and also I, I did this demo um, a bit earlier during my uh, cash script, sorry, uh, intro to BCH workshop. Um, so yeah, just a kind of refresher. So um, yeah, this is uh, this very, very simple. Uh, web app here is uh, just to create some of these uh, NFT tokens and show how that kind of process goes about. Um, what I got here is just basically a wallet set up and then attached it to a cash script contract that would just help me create some of these uh, conditions here. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's just try putting in some random values. Um, what do you guys want for the this NFT name, guys? Do something like block hack. All right, block hack. Uh, and then the symbol could be like that. Uh, let's set the the link to block hack .ca. Uh, decimals. We want zero because um, again, it's it's meant to be NFTs, and if you have like decimals, then it's not really NFTs. Um, I'm just going to use the uh, contract address here for the mint and the token receiving just for demo purposes. And I'm going to create just one um, parent NFT token uh, for now. 
So I click the uh, NFT parent genesis. Um, it's on the right here. You see this very, very long transaction, like raw transaction hash. So I'm going to send this transaction. Um, actually, I might need to change how I'm screen sharing this. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just sorry. Just give me a second. Let me just rechange the screen share to my entire application window. All right. Um, so yeah, so you guys can see this, right? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I got this um, this link with the transaction hash. And let's just pop it into the block explorer here. Yeah, so it takes a while to load up, but we can see that it's uh, on the block explorer on Bitcoin.com. Uh, it's marked as a valid Genesis transaction. Um, I think there's also a token page that we could go about and view this. Um, yeah, so that's the Genesis right there. So let's say if you want to um, create a child uh, NFT token now. So what you would do is copy the, uh, the, the transaction ID that you got from making the parent Genesis. And we're going to try to create a child one. But before we do that, let's just change up some of the names here. Uh, so let's just say block hack child b g h c. Uh, we want to keep the, the supplies and the decimal to be the same. Um, yeah, so everything else should be right. Just going to click on the NFT child genesis, and it should create another raw transaction hash. This one's significantly longer, but when we send the transaction. So we do see that there is a, um, a NFT uh, child transaction uh, for the Genesis created. So if we look at this uh, a bit more closely, what will happen is the, the, previous, um, the previous Genesis for the parent that gets consumed when we create the child uh, transaction for the Genesis. Uh, so so that's basically used up. So if we want to create more NFT tokens from the system, we basically have to mint out more um, NFT parents. So what we will do is, uh, let's say we want to create more, or let's just say two more. Uh, yeah, that should be fine. So uh, this sometimes happens due to uh, uh, infrastructure issues. Uh, I think um, sometimes it gets reset, but. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the node I'm using right now, it's, uh, it's trying to restart, I think. So it may take a while. So, um, but yeah, that's that's the overall idea is that you want to be writing all of the information down like this uh, and then uh, linking the UTXOs from the, the uh, NFT parents to the NFT childs. Um, so this was the original um, NFT parent uh, Genesis transaction. And then here's like, you need to have the right um, UTXOs for the inputs as well. Uh, let me just try this one more time. Uh, if this is working, I'll continue. If not, uh, Joe, just keep going forward. Oh, okay, never mind. So yeah, the uh, the raw trans it, the node is back up. So we're gonna create uh, two more uh, NFT uh, parents uh, tokens that you can use. Uh, so here is the next transaction in the series. And perfect. Yeah, so we can see that it's the uh, it's uh, successfully minted and validated. 
and that so we've created two more of these uh, parent tokens uh, from for for the uh, NFT parents. Um, so let's say if we want to send one of these um, tokens to another address. So I got one up here. I uh, just want to make sure. And I want to send one. So I'm going to send one uh, NFT parent token to the cash adder in the wallet. And we should be able to see what the outcome is very, very shortly. All right, so so it is seen that um, the 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 token is sent uh, properly, uh, but what you'll notice is that there is a burn value of one BGH, and that's basically because uh, the outputs um, because there's two uh, BGH uh, SL, NF, NFT tokens, and we only sent out one. Uh, well, basically, the second one uh, is lost to the UTXOs. So that's where the burn here comes in. Um, so this is something that you guys may want to uh, keep in mind if you want to have better control of burning or if you just want to um, you know, prevent losses of the coins. Um, yeah, so that's uh, basically it uh, for the demos. Yeah, one note on um, on burning, uh, and, and you can see more in the uh, the last talk on uh, infrastructure with SLP is uh, using BCHD. You can pretty much prevent any accidental burns, um, so you'd have to specify that you want to burn one token. So, um, if you're building an application, I would probably really recommend that you use either that or or something that provides the same functionality. Awesome, thanks for that demo there. Um, we got a couple questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, so are the current SLP indexers already uh, creating an index of these NFT hierarchies for quick queries of the relationships? Yeah. Right? Yep. Uh, yeah, SLPDB has probably the best implementation for it, but I think all of them have a have something. Um, there's a few examples if you go to slp.dev that shows some different ways of querying and looking up uh, those sorts of hierarchies. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and another question here. If someone sends a parent token, does that mean the person who receives it can turn it, uh, turn it into any kind of child token they want? Or is the metadata setting only something the original address can do? Hmm. Yeah, yeah so I, anyone can create the uh, the child from them. So you can actually have kind of, uh, depending on how you set up your application, you can maybe utilize that in, in kind of a cool way um, where uh, people could sit on, you know, almost like this, uh, this, this base material that then you can craft NFTs from. So that's, that's a possibility too. Cool. Yeah, I think that uh, wraps up the questions that we had on that segment. If um, you want to take it back over, Joey, uh, you'll sure. need to you'll need to share your screen again if you have more slides there. Okay, cool. Just give me a moment. Oh, yeah, I need to press the share screen first. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, so there's like uh, sort of two things I want to go through. Like, uh, yeah, so I actually went ahead and I actually did do a uh, upload of a Sphere token, a Sphere card. So this is actually on chain. Uh, this is the peep the first. It's a first edition card. It says first is just edition token, but I guess it could say card. Um, so this is actually on chain. You can see the image is uploaded there. Sorry, Joey. Um, can you can you zoom in on that so we can get a nice, cool look at it? Yeah, sure. You can actually. It's actually linked to IPFS. So if I click on IPFS here, it show you the full image. Whoa! Just also, <laughs> how do we get first edition uh, Sphere cards? That's awesome. I want a Pepe card. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, for like, uh, I'm thinking of something to do for the, uh, to the early, uh, early donators of Flipstarter. Maybe I'll give them a starship. I'm thinking like a flagship. Super uh, cool. Yeah. I'm thinking of like having like one flagship per race. So I, yeah, yeah, I think I, I've been thinking about like what to do about that. So uh, definitely, I mean, actually, if I wanted to, I could transfer this card over <laughs> someone. Uh, but you can see here that um, like I put the IPFS in here, that's like linked to the image. The way I've done that is I've done it through uh, this tool. Well, you can do it with any IPFS tool. I've just done it for fullstack.cash because they have an easy drag and drop thing where you drag and then you pay a little bit of BCH and then put it on IPFS. So anyone can play with this. You can put anything on it. Um, this is also using uh, I, a token repository that basically is on the Enter the, the Sphere website. So it allows me to sort of update this and make a bunch of changes. Uh, here, you can see it's a child, right? So if I click parent, it will show you that this actually comes from the Enter the Sphere pre-alpha. Well, I've not uploaded the Enter the Sphere um, uh, logo, the repository. But you can see here it links to icons. Dot, uh, that's not going to load because the, it's um, it's only loads when it's specific. Uh, but you can see here that that's the parent. So that's actually like linked to this, right? So this is the great. This is the really cool thing about SLP. Like on other things um, I've seen, like basically they have an issue where they have to sort of like figure out they have they have to have the full list of items from the game. Uh, or app to basically figure out, well, well, are these like tokens like fake or real, right? Because someone could easily just copy that image, right? And then just create the same token. So how do we know that this token comes from my game for sure, right? And the answer is that. Um, oh, and I want to add another really cool thing is that if I made this, so let's go to this, right? The, the parent token. And if pre-alpha is over, and I burn this token, I wouldn't be able to make any more of those cards. And that's that's it, you know? So I could do that to limit supply. So that's another really cool aspect about the system is that I can actually like just do certain things to ensure that, well, you can never get a first edition card again, right? <laughs> so uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so I'm gonna also go to like, um, there are, there are things you can use to, so this is uh, bchjs.fullstack.cache and they have some rest, com, uh, there's some commands here to create uh, NFT tokens. Um, there's also Swagger, which uh, uh, James talked about. Uh, this is uh, not released yet, but it's gonna be released really soon. And um, it's basically a full node, uh, BCH RPC. And you can use this by just uh, sending a transaction that just follows the NFT. Um, so there's like, so you see there's your NFT Genesis metadata, right? And you can just use these metadata in the send transaction to create NFT tokens using a very, very simple proto buff. Uh, and there's so many ways you can use this. It's literally like plug and play. It's like super cool. And this is SLP validated index on a node so there's no third party trust. You literally run your own node, spin your own node up, connect this, you can connect REST API to it. You can connect anything you want to it. Um, and I think uh, JT, SLP JS also can do NFTs, right? Uh, so you could also uh, install SLP JS and basically uh, issue NFT commands. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's a few different options. Um, I think probably for going into that, uh, checking out some of the past talks would make the most sense. But yeah, I think uh, BCHD is, is probably going to be sort of a central um, central uh, used software in the in the future. Um, it just uh, simplifies a lot of stuff. So I think SLPJS already can use, well, it, it can use a BCHD backend and, and likewise with SLP Lite and um, a bunch of other libraries already can work with it. So Ah, that's cool. That's cool. That's good to hear. Yeah, well, I would say in general, like SLP Lite and uh, the BCHD is like the, the future architecture that we think a lot of people are going to be. I mean, REST API is always there. People are always free to use it. And a lot of people love REST. And you can actually build REST API on top of this pretty easily. 
Uh, but this is like the general architecture we're looking because we're trying to get closer to the node, right? So this is like, when this is released, I believe this will be huge. I actually, uh, for the, for Enter the Sphere, I, I intend to build or move everything over to uh, BCHD. Cool. So let's go and talk about what is the game? Is this loading or is this not? No? Okay. So yeah, I did, Bitcoin, uh, the Sphere is a gaming universe built on Bitcoin Cash. It's, um, it's, it's a project that is basically like, as it scales, it becomes more ambitious. Um, I'm not gonna, you can read that because it's basically like the backstory of the sphere, but the main, the main, the main things is that we want to reimagine the game card, the card game uh, uses blockchain technology. It's like, I think it's a really cool, I, at least I think it's a cool universe because I, I thought of it, but you know, whether people think it's a cool universe or not, that's up to them to decide. Uh, we have a whole read.cash post on it. So if you're interested, I could post that. You can read all about how the game works and the mechanics. Uh, play, uh, players, it's like a collectible card RPG game. So people uh, collect cards and they equip their own characters, create their own avatars, and uh, basically uh, join in the game and climb the tower and fight each other to basically get to the top of the tower. And they, when they leave the tower, they exit with a prize, basically, um, like every week or so. And also, like we want to build an API out that basically, like uh, any uh, Bitcoin Cash dev can use to easily. Uh, like uh, put items on the marketplace and create NFT items and create game items. So we'd really like to do that. So uh, yeah, shall we demo the game? This is a nervous moment for me. So just let me, okay. So the game works via the sphere bot at the moment. There's like a working version of, I should put this in the window working a version of the sphere bar. And um, so is my screen working? Yeah, we, we're seeing everything so far. I'm super okay, excited cool. for this, by the way, like, I, I yeah, so I, I could uh, actually go so we could take tip each other, like, orb, so I can be like, hey, like tip 1000 to JD, right? So this is happening in in your um, your Telegram chat window there. Uh, it should be, but it's not. What's this? Oh. Huh. Oh, I didn't reply. Right? Did I reply? To Hmm. Interesting. What am I doing wrong here? What What is like the, um, like what's happening with the Telegram right now? Like, are you you're able to like send a command that has that that affects the game? Yeah. No. Basically, I I uh, I'm trying to tip him some orb. Oh, okay. The SLP token. So, oh, what happened with the bot? Just give me a moment. Huh, why is it not doing that to me? Is it just, but the, the challenge should work, right? So let me try one down. It's just not responding to my commands. Yeah, are you able to zoom in? So oh, there you go, can... okay, that's cool. Oh, can you not see? Okay, cool. No, so basically he sent me 1,000 orb, I can send him orbs. So we're like tipping SLP tokens to each other. And okay. uh, so basically I've just issued him a challenge for uh, 1,000 orb. And uh, so we're both gonna stake 1,000 orb and then we're gonna play the game, right? So I can accept the duel. So I'm gonna accept the duel and I'll open this link, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna point the mic at the <laughs> blowing the game. Uh, it's 
just so I need to go to waiting for Okay, so I'm waiting for opponent and then I think JT should join. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just loading right now. Okay, cool. So I should just really beat JT really quickly because I'm like, uh, and, uh, so about the frame rate, I think it's because I'm streaming. It's like a lit, oh, I got it slow. Okay. Wow, sorry, the frame rate's like dropping like crazy. Uh... It's also pretty loud. Are you able to lower the volume just a bit for us? Yeah. Wow, the frame rate, dude. So I can actually go like, hey, how is it going? You suck. Yes, I have the uh, uh, Bitcoin Jesus card, which is one of the most overpowered uh, <laughs> cards. <laughs> cards yeah, yeah, I think I'm just going to die. I, just, I think there's like, I actually can't kill her. I'm just going to try. No, I'm just going to go for your straight. If I miss, if I miss, I'll go for your straight. Sorry about my frame rate. I think it's because I've got so much stuff open. It's just like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hit Roger. Roger always comes back alive. So, like. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna try to get it. Oh, okay. Oh, you almost dead. So I, you know, I actually can't see his health. So that's like kind of like the point of the game, is that I have to guess constantly. Um, oh, you're gonna use spice kind of uh, crap. So if I defend, I draw a card. Wow, I'm like really lagging. I, I'm so, so sorry about the frame rate. This like doesn't like run like this usually. It's just you I'm maybe like want to go over it and sort of tell some of the rules for this, because I bet it's sort of confusing to, uh, to see yeah, what? Do you maybe want to go over some of the, the rules for how the game's played? Yeah, so basically like uh, you can attack, like I've got two weapons. You can see the weapons I've equipped here. Um, I can heal myself. There's like a med kit. I'm not using these because I'm waiting for me to. Oh my god, you're killing me. Um, yeah, so I can just punch him. I'm just gonna punch him. Actually, no, I, I should swing the sword. Get the fuck. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh my god, wait. Right, so, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that, uh, that shouldn't have uh, ended so quickly. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, I've been practicing. Yeah, so that's it. I mean, I would, yeah, I would do it again. I mean, do you guys want to watch it again? Ah, it's just the frame rate. I don't know why. The, the, honestly, the frame rate is like never this bad. I don't know what I've done with it. It's well, probably because I. It's, it's probably, probably just because you're streaming. Yeah, it's uh, very uh, yeah. intensive. I'm, actually, I can, my mouse is lagging. Look at this. My mouse is lagging. <laughs> no but, uh, if you go back to the, you go back to the um, Telegram, which is loading. Wow. Yeah. So it shows that uh, he's annihilated me. And uh, now he has won 2,000 orb. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's the, I think the demo was a little bit quicker than I hoped. It's all good. Am I lagging like crazy? I am, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm just like freezing. Yeah, so it's it's pretty cool because you can, um, you, you have these cards at the start and it's, uh, yeah, a lot of strategy choosing uh, what you want to do. It takes down your your motivation levels. Um, so you know, depending on how you play, uh, you can uh, 
yeah, I mean, it really depends on the order in which you play and, and if you're defending or attacking and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so it's it might be sort of hard to, to pick it up just from a video too um, without knowing how that's working, but there's a lot of strategy involved. Um, you choose your deck. So we chose our deck and basically we constructed our deck and then we like basically when, when it plays, it checks your Telegram ID, like for what deck you play, uh, you, you chose and what you equipped and basically it goes into the game. Uh, but I guess that's all not like super obvious. Uh, I just realized I didn't like upload some stuff, like some stuff I wanted to talk about. Uh, so I'm just gonna load. I think it might be because I had it on full screen. I never play it on full screen. So that could be. Honestly, I should not. I should not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or the 50 applications. Oh, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a put. Potato, I bought it for like 500 USD because I was like, Oh, I think we might have lost uh, Joey for a second there. I'm not now. I'm now. I'm not sure if it's me lagging or or if it's Joey lagging. I see his screen share going. Yeah, I, I heard him cut out as well. So I okay. think it's. Okay. I think he his his mic is muted, so he might be talking to us, but we can't hear him. I'll unmute his mic. Joey. Yes, 21st century tech. We're living in the future, guys, and we still got issues. It's all good. Um, I'm sure Joey will be back in just a second. For whatever reason, his mic is permanently muted. Um, cool. I see his face is back. And he's, he's rejigged his settings. Am I back? Am I back? Okay. And he's loading back in. Hello. Hello. Heard you. Yeah, you're back. So did I? Did you guys miss like me talking like ten minutes about the game? Like, no, um, no, no, no. We we, okay. we just lost you for like a two seconds at the end okay. there. Um, yeah, you're you're back now. Uh, and I think you were you were about to give us just a bit of like an overview of like. Like the gameplay, you were talking about choosing a deck. Can you talk about like, like what the actual actions you you are taking during your turn and that sort of thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, um, no, uh, we we uh, pre-built the deck, so basically we would have gone in with decks and our uh, our characters loaded up. Um, in the tower climb, you would go in with like as you climb the tower, you actually start losing your deck. So um, you would go in with say like a hundred cards and basically you, you would have to like either conserve them or you could like use your good cards at the beginning. So uh, there's quite a lot of stuff there that's like linked to your character uh, that we'll be doing a lot through uh, Telegram. Use, we'll, be doing, we'll be doing two things. We'll be doing the Telegram bot and the Discord bot. So a lot of, the, a lot of the matchmaking will actually uh, go through the bots. Well, you could play from the website as well. I just wanted to show you like some stuff uh, and by the way, like that was like a work in progress. So a lot of these placeholders we haven't done yet. We'd eventually like have all the graphics on placeholders like this. Um, there are three races you can choose, Kingdom of Frog, uh, Libert Libertarian Consensus, which is basically like um, crypto trolls, or blockchain trolls. And there's like the Fenian Federation, which are like humans, but they killed off all the men. And uh, the men just ex exists as pets or specimens. Specimens. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the, like when, when that's all complete, the cards will actually look like that. But because that was like placeholders work in progress, I've done it in a way that's like not, because to do this would require uh, a lot more, uh, the assets would have to be 
rendered in game instead of the way I've done it at the moment. So it would take a, a bit more polish. Uh, but it's unfortunate because the frame rate is actually really good. We actually for for this NFT workshop, the reason it was delayed was because I actually like optimized the game from like 130 something megabytes down to like 30 megabytes. So it was a shame that it like lagged so much when I played it because it does not lag uh, like that um, uh, in um, in real life and when we're actually playing it when we're not streaming and running a whole bunch of stuff in the background can imagine yeah. um so two questions about that um who's done the artwork that's currently in the game like there's cool animations for your hero going on um is that you or you have a team working on this oh we have an art team we have like 3d artists we have like concept artists we have uh we have like card artists like there's a bunch of team I, I've, I've been working on this since February, March time. Uh, so right. I'm basically putting a team together. Like my focus was to put the art team together first because I knew that the the I knew that the lore building and the universe building would be pretty crucial in making something that's I guess visually immersive or mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah. So I felt like it was important to get that right first, right? And I knew that I knew that it would be hard to build the art team. Like that would take a long time. So. Yeah, it's uh, we have a team. Uh, the the art team separate from the game team, and the game team separate from the cryptocurrency. So we've sort of got multiple modules uh, that different people are working on. Uh, Very cool. And so this is just I, I actually had this loaded up, but I I realized I didn't actually load it up. But this is like what an example of the marketplace would look like. So you'll be able to trade the cards, and um, you can use orb to level up the cards and so on. Um, and um, can you magnify? No, you can't magnify this. So this is what a, a page of the card would look like. So you have the lore, you can buy and sell. It shows you how rare the card is. Uh, for illustration, you click on these tabs. You'll go to trade history, you'll go to stats, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to show you that because it wasn't um, in. I had thought I'd had those. Um, yeah, card types. There are three main card types, which I guess, like, because the demo happened so fast, you didn't really see them happen. Like, for example, in that game demo, uh, Roger summoned uh, uh, Roger Burr. I mean, sorry, JT summoned <laughs> Roger Burr. And uh, he's actually, like, an overpowered character. Like, for some reason, <laughs> he resurrects himself. He's only meant to have a chance to come back alive, right? But, like, I think there's some, like, balance issue where, like, no matter how, no matter how many times you, you like, uh, eliminate him, he comes back. Like, I don't know if it's... Does <laughs> that... Yeah. <laughs> Does that mimic the real world in any way? Well, I suppose he sort of comes back every time people think he's gone, right? So... <laughs> I mean, you can, see in, uh, you can see in the graphic he's, like, sort of regenerating or something, right, from the blockchain. Uh, Very cool. So equipment cards, you have cryptos, and you saw that when I equipped the, the sword, the sword of pep, sort of peep. Um, I don't know if I showed you hitting because it was like so like laggy. I actually used the sword and I hit um, or tried to hit. Um, and then, you know, combat action or cards you play as you play, the, it only plays once, but it plays with your weapon. So, for example, if you use a card like a trick shot, for example, it says that, you know, this basically stops your enemy dodging you, right? So you can play that card with your weapon. A uh, combat buff is something that like lasts for a few turns, right? So, for example, consensus, you use that card like the, your opponent summons can't attack for like I think three turns or something, uh, something like that. Yeah, um, I guess I can take questions on like any of the gameplay if people are interested. Yeah, I, I have a question about um, like the the lore behind it because it's clearly very crypto world influenced. So, like, tell us a bit of the backstory. How does this fit into, I guess, the greater kind of, yeah, the, the greater kind of crypto world um, merging with, like, the fantasy world? Yeah, sure. I, I, would, say, um, I would say it's like fantasy sci-fi. Um, my inspiration is actually kind of like Chrono Trigger or, like, JRPGs like that, where there's, like, a blend of, like, or, like, Final Fantasy, where there's, like, a blend of... Uh, 
like JRPG, but I didn't want to go down the anime route. I didn't really want to, I want to make something that's also like appealing for like casual audience and not steer too much to like, you know, like cute girls and like, you know, women wearing little clothes and this kind of stuff, but uh, you know, so, so I wanted to do something like that, but also sort of keep it like, sort of more to like the Western real sort of more, uh, gritty sci-fi right so i wanted to blend the two and I, the way i sort of explained to the the music composer uh is basically i wanted something like a cross between chrono trigger and john wick right so it's like john wick but it's <laughs> chrono trigger at the same time um and the story is really uh the universe is uh based on that there is this um there is this planet they discovered which is like basically like an advanced civilization that's like collapsed right so it's like full of ruins and when you first land on the sphere you actually don't get to the tower you land in something called the out zone and you have to like make your way towards the tower then when you enter the tower you fight everyone to get to the top right um and this planet is enclosed by like a impenetrable impenetrable barrier like a energy force field so things can't get out of it, but things can go in. So players can actually go into the sphere, but once they get in, the only way they can get out is by climbing a tower and then basically sitting on this thing called the throne. And then there's like a space elevator that ejects you from the tower, right? So the idea is that at some point, this like advanced magical technological civilization like collapse, right? And why they built this energy barrier, I don't really want to give that out yet. But obviously, if they built like a barrier around the planet, I mean, something, I mean, I guess you don't want something to go out, like, right? <laughs> so I'm going to leave that up to people's imagination, what they were trying to keep in on the planet. Um, and they had this special technology that were these orbs, right? And these orbs are kind of like a special like thing they have that allows you to power like starships and all sorts of crazy like devices, right? That are like incredibly valuable. So when people go to the sphere, they're basically looking for like these treasures, right? To get out of the sphere. And when they do get out of the, the, of the sphere, the stuff they leave is like incredibly valuable, right? To the universe. And um, the universe is based around the three races, which you can see here. So there's like the kingdom of frog and they're basically like advanced like warrior race that uh, has you know massively advanced force field technology and they the first that discovered the the sphere and and the way because they're like an honorable race they they sort of discovered the fear and um and um and basically they sort of declared a neutral zone they're like well you know if anyone comes in and beats us you can take the orbs right so the 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 other two races the liberty the libertariani consensus are actually originally humans but they were like uh, capitalist utopian like you know like blockchain people that were like super rich like these bitcoin whales and you know silicon valley tech 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 tech, tech tycoons like jack dorsey and they just kind of were like i'm sick of like i'm sick of dealing of like humankind let's build this utopia and like merge ourselves with the blockchain so we can live in finance world <laughs> fuse ourselves with the, the code so I can be part of JavaScript or be part of C++ or something, right? And then the experiment failed. So they sort of end up half in code and half in like reality. And so they, and then a lot of them went insane in the process, right? Uh, but that gives them special ability. So they can fly, they can sort of, they don't have to breathe air and they're kind of like, they're kind of like space magic, you know, wizards, right? Cause they can like manipulate the blockchain and cast spells and stuff like that. Then you have the original Earth population, which is the Athenian Federation. And then there was like a point in time in the war, basically back on Earth, that at some point the males and females got into this huge war. And I guess in a normal war, the males would have won, right? But because of advanced cybernetic technology, basically the females were on par because they could, you know, basically enhance themselves using uh, you know, cyber cybernetic enhancements and stuff like that. And that finally ended up with the men being stuck on the moon. And then they, they thought the women weren't crazy, but I mean, the women weren't crazy enough to blow up the moon and then the women blew up the moon and then they all died. And then the, <laughs> the ones that got left over got captured and it just became like sort of playthings for the woman. So 
that's like yeah that's the basis of the universe <laughs> that's like, amazing there's like three factions in the galaxy trying to like yeah trying to like get hold of these orbs and they compete in this like weird competition where they go into the sphere and they try to get these like ancient artifacts and and then every every cycle the the the, the planets the, the the sphere only lets like a certain amount of orbs out of the planet right um so yeah i guess i hope that answers the universe. yeah no definitely like it, it's very um uh, it's very clear how rich uh the the universe is that you're creating um like what kind of role does the story play in the gameplay is there gonna be like um like um uh, like a uh, a uh, like what? Am, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a storyline beside the the gameplay that continues on. Like I kind of related to Magic: The Gathering that has these books that come out and they're novels, and you can read the story. Um, but then the gameplay kind of just uses those characters from from those books to play the game. Is there is there plans on having some kind of uh, media outside of the gameplay? Is is I think what the question is. Uh, I'd love to do that if we had, uh, I mean, obviously game game design or game development as I found is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on whether we can afford to do something like that. But I am a big fan of the Overwatch model. I love how they, I love how Blizzard builds their universes. And the way Overwatch has done is they sort of set a premise. They sort of set the backstory, but they've never really told you, told you like what happens in the actual current timeline, right? So the players uh, make up all these interpretations, and it almost like gives more imagination, right? Like it gives sure. more uh, space for players to create their own stories and to sort of figure out what happened. Uh, like, because because basically the backstory covers everything up to the sphere, right? right. And then basically what's exactly happened between these factions? I have some idea. So I have some idea. For example, I know the Athenian Federation is like really greedy, right? And they actually want to take over the the planet, which is called Ilium Free, and that's actually the official, uh, the sort of name of the planet, which is the Sphere. Uh, but but they've sort of been greedy, and then the and then the the, the blockchain people want to make a business out of it, and basically there's like these sort of like political stuff that happens, you know, around the Sphere, and you know obviously they have their home worlds, they have their fleets and armies and so on. But like like for example, the way I've set it up is like for example, Peep and. Uh, Bitcoin Jesus and Athena, like they're they're free uh, main, uh, first heroes in uh, uh, the story, right? But we don't exactly know what happened to them. Like I don't, I think I feel like if you give give it out, like where are they exactly? Uh, basically, it it sort of the way Overwatch has done it is that, for example, with characters like uh, Tracer or um, you know Winston or so on, they sort of give you nuggets like little nuggets of what's going on or like stories. So that'd be pretty cool, like short stories, right? Or like mm. uh, graphic novels, but they never really tell you exactly what's happening, like in the current timeline. And that gives a lot of space for people to just sort of come up or like speculate about like what's actually going on. I think that's a, that's a great approach to building a universe. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. The, um, the the horror film approach where you you never see the monster because it it builds up in the back of your mind and it's always more vivid than when you actually see it or, or handed have it handed to you. That's awesome. Um, I love how the like you're using um, uh, typical crypto tropes um, in this this fantasy world. It's very cool. Um, do you think or how do you feel this will be? Um, perceived by like no coiners or like people outside of the crypto space are you targeting are you targeting gamers outside the crypto space and kind of hoping that they'll get pulled into the crypto sphere or are you um are you expecting more crypto initiated folks to be playing your game more um to begin with uh, i think it'll develop i have definitely thought about it like in terms of that i think i want to make it appealing to like uh the wider gaming uh uh, industry. Uh, so I think like eventually like the way they will sort of see it is like, hey, you know, you have warrior, you have soldier and you have like space wizard, right? So um, and 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 but but like the way I see it at first, we'll be targeting the Bitcoin cash community. 
And then from there, we'll move on to the wider uh, crypto games community, which is obviously still still pretty big. I mean, I mean, actually, one thing I didn't mention uh, is that a lot of these games uh, that I've shown you are actually profitable. So these companies are actually making money. Um, and that's not, that's just games. I mean, you include all the gambling stuff. Like these are, you know, one of the few, you know, current applications on in cryptocurrency outside of exchanges and mining that actually turn a positive revenue. Uh, they actually make money from actually doing this stuff. So, so already, even though uh, crypto games haven't gone mainstream, you know, there's already money being made. Like, you know, these these uh, games are self sustainable, right? That they. They get they get money from you know selling cosmetics, selling loot boxes and other things, or fundraising, and they can sort of keep that going, right? So already, I feel like we can if we can get there. I feel like then I'm gonna think about mainstream, and I guess if we think about mainstream, I'll probably build another game on top of because the great thing about NFTs is that you could actually take the NFTs and put them into another game, right? So I could technically build like a battle royale game, like. On the in the same universe, mm -hmm. but just move those NFTs across and be like, hey, if you have a NFT, a gun NFT card, you can take the NFT gun card into the from the card game into the uh, you know uh, what do you call yeah. it the the uh, the battle royale game. Or yeah, yeah. if actually like you have a game, say John, you develop the game, and then you are like, hey, let's do a cross collaboration. Why don't you let me? Why don't you let me move some of my stuff, and then my stuff does something in your game, and your stuff does something in my game? For example, if someone went from my game to your game, and they unlock something, maybe they can bring an NFT item back to my game and basically unlock a, a special level or something like that. So I think when we see a lot of this stuff being more and more networked and efficient in the next five or 10, I would say five years to 10 years to really get to that mainstream stage i think it's going to be ma massive because i'm a, like really i'm a big gamer myself i you know i grew up on like everything like runescape ultima online world of warcraft i just know like i just know like how much that economy could potential potentially be worth and you know very interesting point like uh, you know my my sister plays a lot of final fantasy 14 and she's had she's built this like beautiful virtual house completely virtual just like a house she's designed in the MMORPG, and people like offer her real money to buy an offer, and I think that's like you know what I mean. That's that's definitely like the future. Like that's gonna happen. Like it's just not gone to a point where people have accepted that as I don't know if you know. I mean, people have not gone to the point where people have kind of gone like, hey, this stuff is valuable, right? Yeah, if yeah. Like a sword, someone wants then mm -hmm. actually that's that's actually value. That's actually like people yeah. will buy marketplace, right? I think it's only a matter of time. I think you're right. Like it's uh, this is if crypto's in its infancy, infancy, like crypto gaming is even smaller and it has so much room to grow. And like I, I, um, I saw like it just in the past few weeks or months, um, like you know, um, uh, first edition Charizard holographic sold for like seventeen thousand yeah. dollars. Like you know, and that was a card that I had when I was a kid, maybe yeah, like exactly. twenty five years ago or something like I that. You know. That. It, it's it. just it's just a matter of time. You hold on to it, you keep it safe, and 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 eventually it can be be worth a lot. And like that digital scarcity, provable scarcity, um, adds value if the market is there, if the demand side is there, and the supply side is limited. It's only a matter of time. And so uh, I think gaming is is a perfect use case for NFTs, and and crypto gaming is going to be huge in the near future. Um, I've been peppering you with personal questions because I'm super uh, into this space and passionate about it. But let's uh, let's yeah, let's get it. some crowd let's get <laughs> some crowd questions answers, and then I'm sure I, I'll have more questions for you after that. Um, okay, um, this one is actually I'm going to save this one because it's a little bit more generic. So let's talk. Uh, let's continue talking about the game here. Um, so any game involving crypto always attracts scammers and cheaters, people trying to hack the system, um, uh, with a room full of programmers and like crypto heads, like, you know, uh, it, it's a small yet, um, people that understand these systems. It's, um, like what kind of, uh, what kind of, I guess, guards do you have in place or have you considered how people can scam or specifically cheat in this game? 
I think right off the bat, having NFTs and having it cryptographically backed, like you prevent people from creating fake um, uh, game pieces. But like, uh, have you considered anything outside of that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've considered some potential scenarios where um, this came on YouTube. Yeah, we put. I mean, we've. Um, it's cancel. What? Oh, sorry, I'm still on. It's for some reason it just like showed I was leaving the thing. Yeah, we've definitely like designed it uh, architecturally. I, well, I would say that it would definitely need a lot more. I mean, actually, for we're still just fundraising for pre-alpha, so I'm still expanding a team. Um, currently, there's a we're trying. We're getting on board a some tokenomics consulting. Uh, there'll be some security stuff. So definitely. For sure, that we'll be getting consultations about like how to secure, uh, you know, some of these things are happening, and they happen with every sort of crypto project, really. I mean, obviously, games maybe there's a bigger, bigger, I don't know, bigger interest in people hacking, but uh, like, uh, yeah, I mean, we've had people trying to hack Spice, you know, Spice Bot and you know, Spice Feed, and it just happens. Like, I think people always look for some sort of flaw to mm. sort of. Uh, figure out how to like get get things out of the system. So definitely like super serious about making sure. And I think keeping yeah, I think I think the group the group ID does protect that from a lot of that from happening, like the the more scammy type stuff. And um, yeah, like the the game side, like the reason why we chose you know having to attach like your actual like ID to it is that we. Oh, well, I realized designing very early that people don't like cloning Telegram IDs as, as easy as they can clone username logins. So that's why I've designed a system like, you know, to sign up on the sphere, you have to link your Telegram. Mm. Like, obviously, you can still you can still bypass that. There are poor ways you can just like create. But in general, just by that mechanism of like, you know, having to buy a new SIM card to create every like account is like quite annoying for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, we also don't allow people to create more than one character, so that's another way to sort of, um, at the moment anyways, I mean, in the future it might allow people to have more avatars, but at the moment, we think it's good that people, yeah, I, 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 I like the idea that people sort of have to put an identity to their character. So the moment you start being able to like create a lot of avatars, I think that takes away from that. Like, this is my character. And we're going to have cosmetics, we're going to have things you can like, you know, put on the character and have poses and stuff like that. So, so yeah, but, but definitely for sure, like we need to like iron out like every single possibility. And I'm pretty sure like in pre-alpha or whatever, people will find vulnerabilities that we, we didn't know about, which is why we need to be very careful about it. That's why the pre-alphas are limited to 150. And basically we're going to have a much smaller play test group and then we're going to have consultations. So, we we want to iron those. Obviously, that's no guarantee, right? But but we want to iron those as much as possible, basically. That's awesome. I love that you're going to add um, customizable things for your character too, which of course will be NFTs in themselves. So not only do you have like the the gameplay mechanics as NFTs, but you'll have um, skins, as I understand it, as as NFTs potentially. Say so, say so, what? Sorry, I missed that. I missed that question. I was saying that not only will you have like gameplay mechanics, like the cards themselves as NFTs, but you, you said you'll have customizable um, character, like apparel or skins yeah, yeah. as NFTs. That That's super definitely. cool. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, that's why I showed you the avatar link system, right? Because eventually what you'll be, you'll be able to attach those cosmetics to the avatar. Right. So when you move them out of the game, those, those will show up like in other places because you don't right. actually need to go back to the Sphere server to see that. Um, so yeah, but that's like a more complicated, I don't really want to reveal that, but that's like, of a, course, of course, uh, keep, a keep a couple of things thing. tucked yeah, yeah, into, yeah, your, into like, your pocket. Yeah. And I almost, I'm, I'm almost afraid of revealing too much because there's a lot of, well, I mean, you work in tech and I'm sure you understand that, you know, a lot of times we want to do stuff, but when it comes to actually doing it, the challenge is much greater mm -hmm. than you ever imagined. Right. So mm -hmm. there could be. Technical problem, technical challenges that we run into that basically would make some of these things. So I'm very cautious of promising too much. Right. Basically. Yeah. 
yeah, setting expectations is important and and it's always great to be pleasantly surprised, but with an over delivery when you kept it quiet and then you like open it up and it's like, holy crap, there's so much here. Um, that's amazing. So you've been talking about this alpha test and you, you, you showed us a demo. How do we get our hands on it? Can we get, how do we get on the list to be, you know, an early player of this game? Well, I mean, you could you could go on uh, if you if you uh, if you pledge to the flip starter, which is almost complete, I think. Uh, I mean, the pre-alpha is closed. Um, I am planning to drop something cool to the pre-alpha. I haven't figured out exactly what, but um, yeah, definitely anyone that pledges to the flip starter, which is almost complete. Uh, I'm just making sure I type this right. Yeah, so anyone who pledges to the flip starter, I mean, act, uh, will automatically get access to pre alpha. Um, so, um, that's, yeah, that's basic. That's basically it. Um, I sort of, I'm backtracking. Sort of, your your question was, when can you play the game? Or? Well, no, I my first question was, how does one get in on like the the early alpha testing or like throughout the stages of testing? But then my follow up question now is. When do you see like I know we, we don't want to over um, overestimate or anything, but when do you envision or when when would you ideally have the first open release of the game? Ideally before Christmas, but that is uh, pretty ambitious. I hope That's we get. Very, yeah. Uh, but if not, then it'll definitely be like maybe like early or er, very early next year, probably like first. Ideally, and, yeah, ideally, I don't want to I don't want to promise, but. Uh, Right. No. Is that a huge part of it? Is that uh, if we if we do succeed at this part of pre funding the pre uh, funding the pre alpha, it's also making sure the team is exactly where I want to be. So it's aligning a bunch of things. It's not about releasing the game. It's aligning a bunch of things. So I make sure when the game that actually gets released is something people will enjoy. So I almost don't want to rush the process. Um, I don't want to rush the process to like how do I put it like um, yeah I don't want to rush the process so the game feels like not what I envisioned it to be um, right. yeah basically that makes sense of course yeah uh, you want to yeah you want to make sure that people are going to be able to play and enjoy it and you can't uh, you can't rush perfection you can't rush art it needs to come out when it's ready uh, but that is that is very exciting to hear that you plan on. You're aiming to have it out by Christmas, but I, yeah, I imagine um, imagine things things are difficult to to make sure it's it's ready for release. Um, okay, there is another question here from the audience. It's not directly related to your game, but we might we might jump off and jump back on. Um, let's see here. Um, so, how will SLP or NFT work and interact with something like? Uh, like Hyperledger Indie or some other self-sovereign identity solution in your authorization use case. So it's going back to something you were talking about earlier. Uh, can I let um, JT answer this? I ha I'm having my laptop thing again, but I can see it running low. So okay. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug it in before the thing that happened to me last time. OK. Uh, um, if, uh, if, if one of the other two can yeah. answer that question, I'll be really grateful. Because it'll literally cool. take me five minutes. And if I don't plug it in, <laughs> it's going to be like that thing. Where it's yeah, a repeat. Um, could you repeat the question? Quick? Yeah, the question is, how will SLP NFT work or interact with something like Hyperledger Indie or some other self-sovereign identity solution um, within like the, the, the authorization use case? Uh, that's a good question. I have <laughs> no idea <clears throat> off the top of my head. Um. Yeah, there's. You can do a lot of stuff uh, between linking Bitcoin Cash and and a lot of different blockchains. Um, I'm not I'm not familiar with uh, how Hyperledger authorization works. So I, I don't really have a, a good idea at all on that. But um, yeah, I think uh, you know as we see more um, more projects that form SLP bridges to different blockchains. Um, That'll become a lot easier. Uh, right now, there there really isn't any of that, so it's going to be um, a lot more difficult for anyone that wants to take that on. But you'd be the first person who's you know really really achieving that, so that'd be a, a really cool thing. 
Awesome. Cool. Well, Joey is uh, getting his laptop plugged in. Let's take a quick look at the poll here. We got a bunch of gamers in the house. Um, most of the folks here are excited about gaming in terms of NFTs, but still um, a fair amount of folks are, are interested on unique financial instruments, authentication tokens. Uh, nobody's interested in, in proof of attendance, um, but um, uh, some folks are also interested in crypto art. Um, I think eventually we're going to have a, an NFT for block hack for people that come out uh, and attend and it's like you know it'll be like your your uh, we, where we used to give out stickers to put on your laptop when you came to an in-person event it's gonna be like this invite um, this this badge proof of attendance kind of badge and that might also have implications on if you if you come to several hackathons uh, and and continue to build out the space with us so we're working on um, our gears are turning on those kind of ideas um, let's see here um, have you created your own NFT yet? We got 33% have created their own FT NFTs. That's super cool. Um, and 67% still haven't found the right use case. So I think that's, um, that is, there's a huge part of, of creating NFTs. They're, they're awesome and they're great, but finding the exact use case that, that gives them value is going to be very important. And, um, uh, just over 50% have not, um, dealt with any of the NFT platforms that we have listed here, but there's a, 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 a few folks that have, uh, that got, got involved with CryptoKitties um, and a few folks that have gotten involved with at least two out of the three CryptoKitties, Gods Unchained or Decentraland. Very, very interesting stats there. Joey, did you get your laptop all plugged yeah, in? Are you, are you yeah, safe yeah. or not? Awesome. Before it, um, yeah, like last time it powered down, right? You know these, like, yeah, I think I might, I, I, I'm, I'm sick of Apple. I'm really sick of Apple. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, yeah, just, it's just been like, yeah, no, but you know, like these Apple products, once they go down, like the mm -hmm. power is off, like you plug mm -hmm. them back, and it takes like five minutes or whatever to, yeah, to get it. Yeah. <laughs> so my friend, like, phone, like an Android phone, like you know, it's like auto power, plugs it in, turns off, and I'm like, well, you know. Like great. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, very cool. And do, I, I don't see any more questions coming up. Um, but like, I'm super excited to try out this game. It looks really cool. I want to try it on my own machine and um, and, and give it a go. I I like that. It, it's very interesting that you. Um, you decided to couple it with Telegram and Discord. I think that's very um, that that adds an extra layer of of um, finding out if people are unique humans, especially in a game format when sometimes you get like a, a certain starter package, and then people just create a bunch of accounts to get those, and then they trade all of the cards or all the items to to one account. Uh, it prevents that kind of gaming of the system that I really like. Um, do you have? Yeah, do you have uh, any other kind of thoughts along those lines of verifying unique humanness? Verifying unique humanness? Hmm. Yeah. Not really. What was the verifying? Uh, huh. What, so what was the? You, you, you integrated Telegram and, and you want to integrate Discord where you have to pair your account with your Telegram so it it's harder for people to just generate multiple accounts, right? You have to go out and buy a SIM yeah, card, yeah, yeah. like you said. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So that, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I don't know about that. I think the, I think the way I approached it was that I wanted to make it like a more social experience, right? So, for example, in that Telegram chat, if there are more people in it, then people, everyone would have seen that JT destroyed me, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That that text would change, like if it was like more of a stalemate, but because he killed me so fast. It was like annihilate, right? So, <laughs> so, so we would have a link, like in the future. You click on that, you can actually see us playing. So, very uh, cool. yeah. So uh, it's just introducing more of a social. It's meant to be a very casual game. Um, the game's average around three minutes. Both I don't know if that lasted three minutes. Um, and it can go up to about maybe seven, eight minutes at long at most. But you can play on mobile. It's not meant to be. You know, it's, it's browser based. Obviously, as you can see, it's not meant to be something that. 
uh, uh, it's not meant to be something that's like, yeah, it's not meant to be like a, a game on Steam or something like that. But it could be, maybe, if it continues to develop. Because mm -hmm. uh, like Babylon Engine, the great thing is they're coming out of a native library, which would allow you to change it to a native mobile game or a native uh, PC game. But um, but at the moment, I'm really looking at making a social thing, right? So, you know, like when people climb and get to the top of the tower, we'll like actually have like a Twitter thing going like, you know, Joran has has got to the throne and exited the sphere with like 1,000 orb or something, right? Like put your like face on it. <laughs> so it'll be like Hunger Games, you know? And then it'll be like winner of cycle 22 or something. Um, right. So yeah, it was really from that. Uh, I think the, the identity thing only sort of came in when I thought more about it. And I was like, yeah, actually, it's good to link people with their social media accounts because then they, it's, it's harder for them to just spam, right? If there is a, and also, I guess, you know, I sort of had this experience of, um, I think, several games where you can only have one character. And I always felt like when they do that, you tend to just be really invested in that one character, right? Like, uh, you know, if things change that happens, that character is permanent. That's even like more hardcore. Mm -hmm. Because then you're like really like, you know, you're vested in it because you can't just go out and create another character. And, you know, yeah. Like the like rogue rogue type games where it's like you know do or die, uh, yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're really you're playing for keeps every time. Uh, that's super cool. Um, yeah, I really like like as we know like the um, like the whole esports uh, arena is growing more and more, and it's been fueled um, fueled now with you know being lo on lockdown. Everybody's in their home playing playing games, watching TV. So that's very interesting. Like you're baking into it the social element, the the easy viral ability of being able to just like pop it on, pop a link on Twitter, pop a link on Telegram or Discord, and then people can click and tune in. Uh, yeah, that's that's very cool. Very very cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joey, for being here and showing us your game. Um, that I had a blast. I really like talking about NFTs and the bleeding edge of the crypto space and the bleeding ed edge of technology. Um, I look forward to seeing this game develop more and I can't wait to see you come back next uh, block hack and show us how far you've gotten. Cause you've, you said you just started this in February. So it's amazing how far you've gotten, <laughs> uh, gotten already. So it's, it's super exciting to, well, I just, uh, I just, it has actually, it's actually really optimized. I'm actually just, I'm just, uh, Sad that I can't show it. Like, I, what I want to do after this is, I guess I'll do a video where I can show you, like, actually how it looks. So yeah, I'll please. Um, though I do have, uh, how much time are we? Because I do have like another bit on genetics, but um, oh, it's not we, too long. It's probably like ten minutes or something. I'm just gonna quickly run through it. But right. Yeah. No. We we're just at we're coming up to two hours. Um, cool. It's like, yeah. If you wanna, you wanna. I'm just gonna go through it quickly because you know, honestly, it's not a subject that I'm like super, super like knowledgeable about. It's very genetic algorithms are complicated and I've only started uh, beginning learning on them. So I'll just share my screen and just quickly go through. It's not gonna take long. I believe we're already at two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanna show some um, genetic stuff that has been done on uh, SLP as projects. So this is something, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see it. It's just small, isn't it? I'm going to magnify it. So yeah, like this is the, you can actually, I'll, I can link these if people are interested in like genetics and, you know, stuff on uh, SLP. So there's something uh, JT built. It's called, uh, it's called, it's called mpc.cache. So the idea is pretty simple, basically using genetics, you know, you, you would create these uh, just random characters and they would have like fetishes or medical conditions and phobias and you know you know race religion this kind of stuff and and i guess when people when you have two parents right it's just like well what happens when you breed like you know say someone that's christian with someone that's an atheist right um, and so the way he has done this and the way it's all done is basically uh, hash value is just like a number. So what he's done here is he's, so as you know, every NFT or every SLP token has a unique token ID. 
So what he's done is he's taken the token ID and he's used something called, he apply, it takes a random number, right? So basically the uh, token ID is like a random, a big number. So that's all it is, a big number and he applies a probability source. And he uses something called, uh, how do you pronounce that, JT? Modulus, modulus? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and basically modulus just, uh, Plus that to uh, plus that on a curve that creates like an infinite, like array, uh, infinite like every an infinite extractor that you can extract iterations of like numbers. So every time he runs the extract remainder, it would create a new number based on modulus and based on the hash. So it will be unique to this. Uh, it will be unique to this item. Uh, obviously, um, NFTs are generated using like SHA two five six. Um, so the way the way it would be done is, uh, for example, would generate like a uh, a curve of like, you know, zero to one hundred. And for example, if like you have pink hair and pink hair is very rare, then only one would be pink hair and one to forty would be black, right? Um, and then, you know, he just basically extracts that number from uh, from uh, what do you call it the curve. And um, let me just yeah, so here you can see like he's like constructed for every like attribute he's constructed like from the modulus he's gone like you know using the data like parsing it and going like hey you know what are the chances from this and this is basically like he's generated so there's a lot more names so he's generated a lot more like probabilities for like name. Uh, this probability for like uh, sexuality, and then he takes uh, this, and you know that you take that random big number and you know use a successful generator. He basically manages to create like arrays, and uh, the successive generator. So every time he takes a successive generator, he uses the token ID to create. Uh, the extract remainder here, the next value, is a next value that is created from this thing where he's extracted from the, the hash, right? So from that, every hash he uses, he can use this code to create a probability curve for every, just for everything that he wants, like religion, you know, gender, and uh, yeah, you can see it here. So. So here, then he just basically takes that data and he basically outputs it to like, uh, 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 what do you call it? something like, uh, so he, he does a console log here. So that's meant to be printing out the NPC info, but he goes like further here where he goes, well, you know, I can take that data that he's taken from this, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the successive generator, which is created from the token ID, right, using uh, mod modulo, I think. Um, and then he creates a, where am I, where am I? Yeah, he creates a data structure, right? So it outputs it into a data structure, and you can use that data structure for your app. So for example, if you wanted to have a 3D program and you can basically use these attributes, like a primary race Asian, right, then you just make that 3D mod model, uh, model Asian. Um, and so what he can do from that is that the parent token ID, he can take that uh, token ID and he can trace the uh, family tree, right? So when you create a new uh, token that's like linked to the two uh, parent tokens, he can link it to the two parent tokens and use the blockchain to trace back who the parent, parent is. And using the parent's seed, which will output this exact same data, right? Because remember the, Remember the uh, this this ran basically it's a random number generator. The random number generator that generates from the seed is always going to create exactly the same like attributes of like this uh, NPC character, right? And using that, he can basically add a bunch of he can basically add hey like how much of that is going to pass onto the child, right? Um, and then inherit some of the information from two of the parents. And create a new a new uh, child that uh, inherits like random things from both of the parents, right? 
and all, and also add a little bit of uh, mutation Be because obviously now because there's also a new uh, with well, the child there's also a new token ID right so the new token ID there'll be a new random figure that's successive and you can constantly generate new figures to create this the same uh, you know data curve sorry number curve that he would take depending on which attribute it is and how he wants to divide it whether it's hair color or or uh, age or whatever, and he can just use that to create like, you know, so here it goes, hey, finally, I'm gonna print the child's belief from the uh, mom and dad's beliefs. And this code is all open source, I can link this, you can look at this, uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. I don't really wanna dive too deep into it because I'll take too much time. Is there anything you wanna add, JT? Um, yeah, I mean, this is just like a super simple proof of concept, like it's not built out to be a, a working project, but I mean, you can run it and, and sort of see how it works. Um, but yeah, like don't expect too much from it. It's a, it's pretty much just a super simple implementation of this idea. Um, so. Yeah, so that's one way of doing it. And I, I showed this because it was the, it was the thing I can do without doing another totally like one hour long workshop. But there's another project that uh, came from earlier hackathon called uh, Crypto Pandas. And uh, Crypto Pandas actually does a similar kind of thing, but instead of doing it, they go one step further. So they go, now I'm going to take the random seed that's generated from the token ID, and I'm going to use that data to actually segregate that into ex like genes. So they have like done it exactly in the way biology would have done it, which is like each attribute is a gene. It could be like dominant or recessive and you can like it's it's just way it's just way too complex to go into it. But again, the code is all up there, open source. So here it says like, hey, you know, assign to mutation to baby. You know, same concept. Um, you can look through the code. There's like the the how he spliced up the genetics is in there. He's got a video up there. This is like all the traits. So he's like sliced that stuff. JT did, but he's like done a thing where he's gone one step further and instead of just instead of going, hey, this is a probability curve, let's divide those probability curves into genes and actually have each gene mean like, well, you know, just basically, and it's an entire topic, you can you can Google genetic algorithms, there's a huge study of it. So, you know, for example, for this gene, he's like sort of labeled, hey, you know, what these genes could actually express, right? So there's all these colors for eye color, um, you know, uh, I can link the video. Um, if people want, and he's like showing it. So people are interested in doing genetics on SLP or doing, uh, yeah, like this is like the simple or complex, like definitely investigate these two repos and see what they're doing. Cause you could probably, you wanna create something, you could probably just like learn a lot from just how they've like structured this. And this one uses SLP DB. So it's all there. And we went through SLP DB on, uh, over the intro talk. And so it's calling data from the SLP DB about what the, uh, token IDs are and taking that token ID and uh, you know parsing that to basically create the genetic data, right? Um, and that's all it is. All it is, it's it's a it's a it's a random. You, you trace. The, that's how CryptoKitties does it. There's like a, they use a random seed, and then they trace the they trace the parents, and then you know because the parents are their parents, right? So you would be able through the blockchain, you'd be able to create this entire tree of the family. And you can, with CryptoKitties, what they even added is that uh, certain traits only come after a certain amount of generations, right? So you could have like after 10 generations, only this trait only appears after 10 generations. You can, you can do that as well. So yeah, that's it. And uh, I think that completes my talk. Um, don't know if there's any other questions because I don't want to, I think I've been, <laughs> I didn't realize I've taken. Uh, there we go. That was awesome. No, that was a great addition to um, to the presentation. So, are you planning on using um, genetic cryptographic genetics to in, in your game at all? Is there going to yeah, be yeah, lineages? Not, yeah, definitely not pre-alpha. Pre-alpha definitely would not include that scope. Uh, we were doing we were doing something called version one of the NFTs, and basically at some point people will swap that for version two. So we have an updated NFT. At the beginning, the NFT items will not use a lot of metadata. Uh, when we update that, that will like they'll be able to swap it out for like version two. 
Um, and version two will have a lot more uh, metadata. So the metadata in there, but we won't allow, you won't be able to uh, merge special cards like Spice Cannon or like Roger Ver, but we will allow people to create their own cards. So you could create your own weapon and merge your, like you can merge different uh, swords together and merge different items together. Um, and that will use genetics. We also, I mean, I mean, this is like all like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I can say a lot of stuff, but whether that will get funding or the, you know, profit to do that, I don't know. But um, definitely really interested in letting people have pets. So pets will definitely have like reproductive genetics. Wow. That is, that is obviously like the roadmap to this is, is quite long and yeah, it makes sense that that wouldn't be into in the pre-alpha phase, but I, again, look forward to seeing how this develops and evolves as you continue to build it. And uh, I think it's a great idea and I'm super excited. So uh, I think we're going to wrap it up there. And so again, I want to thank you, JT, Jerry, and Joey for being here today and uh, giving us some gr a great talk on non-fungible tokens and how they are built in the SLP space. Um, again, I want to remind everyone that if you want to, um, to check out all of our previous talks, uh, SLP specifically has a great set of talks going from intro into more, um, you know, advanced topics and you can check them out on our channel, which you can find just uh, by clicking there and giving us a follow. You'll see, uh, you'll be notified as we put out more and more um, content here. And um, this is this is going to be the, the final week of content that we have for you guys until we, we put out the... Um, the, the judging and the the final the final push to see um, what kind of projects are, are, are going to come out of this hackathon. So this is it's coming down to the wire. It's still not too late, uh, folks. So you're not going to want to miss out on your chance to um, to join. So if you follow this link just below the screen here, you'll be taken to our resource hub where you can still sign up. Um, but the date for submission of your projects is coming up this week on uh, the 6th but do us a favor and sign up as you're signing up for a block hack. Also sign up for your slot to present um, and it, you'll be surprised on what you can build in a very short period of time. Uh, when we've done hackathons before, we've done it over a weekend. That means Friday to Sunday and by Sunday you've already built your MVP. So you'll be surprised how much you can build in, in a few days. Um, and of course, there's we also have bounties for folks that are just building a business plan, a business idea, so you won't necessarily have to have a technical demo. Um, your project will definitely be stronger and will be uh, applicable for the, the bigger grand seed uh, funding prize. But if you're looking to, to um, you know, build a business and you just have time to work on the business plan, we've got a prize for you. So it's still not too late. You're not going to want to miss out on your chance. Um, so go click the link and sign up. Um, and uh, on that note, I want to thank everybody for being here. It's been a blast. I'm super excited for this last push. Uh, we have we still have a few more talks uh, this week, so definitely tune in for that. And um, you'll find the links again in our resource hub for our Discord, uh, where uh, Joey's there to help you out with your projects for these last few days. Uh, JT and, and Jerry are there as well. We're all there to help and support you as you're building your businesses and going for that last push. So. I want to thank you again, Joey, JT, and Jerry. Do you have any last last moment words for everybody? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, like, uh, we, up, you know, I don't, I don't know if people check the portal, but we actually sort of changed the wording a little bit because I felt like maybe it felt some things might have not been said as well as they should have. But uh, any any project that is, you know, on BCH and you know has is using BCH and has any sort of plan or interest in tokenizing or utilizing SLP technology is, is also up for, for, you know, as long as it's a good, good idea, a business, yeah, we'll, 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 be interest, we'll be interested in it. Like, you know, you could just have your project and then make the token and then we can figure out the tokenomics, you know, by uh, later. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you again, Joey, JT, and Jerry. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, in, tomorrow we have another set of talks for you. So I will see you then. And until then, I'll see you in the Discord. And I'll see you in the next workshop, everybody. Goodbye. Okay. See ya. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you. Bye. Take care.